Hello and most welcome to H1932. We will today start a brand new text and it's been some hassles preparing this been going on for about 40 minutes. It's a bit like the synchronicity or something, some evil synchronicity doesn't want us to do this. Anyhow, the text is Wittgenstein and the dualism of the inner and the outer. It is by Hao Tang. And I will start directly from where the text starts. And with the introduction, I'll skip the abstract this way. No, by the way, I read it. I might always read it. I think it could be helpful. Abstract, a dualism characteristic of modern philosophy is the conception of the inner and the outer as two independently intelligible domains. Wittgenstein's attack on this dualism contains Deep insights. 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 The main insight excavated from 304 and 293 LPI is this our sensory consciousness is deeply shaped by language. And this shaping plays a fundamental role in the etiology of the dualism. Etiology. <laughs> yeah, and dualism. <laughs> I locate this role in learning of a sensation language. Sensation language. Mm. I think it should be remembered as well as protophenomenon. Sensation language by showing that this learning is under another aspect the incision of language. Namely the infliction of cuts upon certain natural primitive unities between the inner and the outer. 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 These cuts driven by powerful forces eventually harden into an entrenched division between the inner and the outer thereby providing a constant soil for the dualism. That this dualism is rooted in the very learning of language is caused, is caused for ambivalence about language. Introduction. We routinely make use of the distinction between the inner and the outer. That is between what is inside and what is outside our minds. Outside our minds. 
outside our minds. <clears throat> This distinction is perfectly in order, but it tends to suffer a certain deformation in philosophy, especially in modern philosophy. Mm -hmm. What this deformation does is turn this routine distinction into a problematic dualism, namely into the conception of the inner and the outer as two domains that are independently intelligible This dualism, which I shall call the dualism of the inner and the outer, has been attacked by many philosophers. Wittgenstein's attack on it contains special insights, but these insights are often buried deep in his difficult texts. Indeed, <laughs> to say the least, my aim in this essay is to excavate and amplify some of these insights. My concern here is not to show that the dualism of the inner and the outer is an intellectual disease. <laughs> but to lay bare its etiology using Wittgenstein as a guide but also going beyond him somewhat I begin by directing attention to an underappreciated strand in the so-called private language argument in PI. There I unearth a particular diagnosis on the dualism according to which it is caused by an intellectualist conception of language. This Diagnosis is strictly speaking wrong, but there are genuine insights behind it. Behind it. Behind, behind it. it. The main insight is this our sensory consciousness, a large part of the inner is deeply shaped by language and this shaping plays a very important role in the etiology of the dualism of the inner and the outer the outer okay. 
I locate this role in the very process of learning a sensation language as described by Wittgenstein. This is done by showing that this learning is under a different aspect, what I call the incision of language. That is the infliction of cuts upon certain natural and primitive unities between the inner and the outer. These cuts, these cuts, driven by powerful forces, eventually harden into an entrenched general division between the inner and the outer, thereby providing a constant background and fertile soil for the dualism of the inner and the outer. That this dualism is thusly rooted in the very learning of a language is cause for ambivalence, ambivalence. A closely related ambivalence about language runs deep in Wittgenstein in a way that echoes Kant's ambivalence about reason. 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 <laughs> reason. <laughs> Chapter two. Two dualisms attacked by Wittgenstein. The inner and the outer are related to each other in very diverse ways. These may be roughly but usefully grouped under two broad headings, namely intelligence and sentience. In both cases, the inner is generally manifested in the outer. In the intellectual case, Thought is generally manifested in action. action. In the census case, sensation is generally manifested in behavior. Behavior. Mm -hmm. Thought and action, expressive of thought, are distinctive of rational animals, while sensation and behavior, expressive of sensation, are distinctive of animals in general. General. <laughs> general. <laughs> This broad grouping matches the fundamental Kantian division 
between understanding and sensibility, a division that is also present, though in less rigid form, in the large-scale structure of the PI. Very roughly, Wittgenstein's reflections on following a rule concern the intellectual case, while the private language argument concerns the sensuous case. The dualism of the inner and the outer takes different forms in these two cases and comes under attack in both. My focus will be on Wittgenstein's attack on the census case of the dualism. But this focus should not be taken to imply that the sensuous can always be understood in abstraction from the intellectual. that this is not so with us rational animals is a fundamental Kantian insight. Moreover, this Kantian insight is also a central strand in the private language argument, as has been shown by John McDowell. This strand, as McDowell characterizes it, is Wittgenstein's attack on another dualism. Namely, the conception of human consciousness as consisting of a conceptual scheme and a non-conceptual census given that justifies acts of conceptualization. Sensuous. <laughs> Such a kind of givenness, McDowell says, is a myth. Myth, myth, <laughs> moth. moth. <laughs> is it a man or a moth? Is it a myth or a moth? <laughs> it is a form what he, following Wilfred Sellers, calls the myth of the given. Given. To overcome this myth is to see our way through the realization that our sensations, insofar as we are rational animals, are already infused with conceptual content already shaped by the hand of reason. Reason!
texture, the strand that McDowell focuses on. That is the attack on a problematic conception of givenness is salient in such a passages as 258, etc. The central strategy of this attack is to press questions of right, both of correctness and of justification against the supposed applications of a supposed private language. But there are also many passages in which questions of right are absent while a different angle of attack is salient. Mm -hmm. Salient. Salient indeed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> This is just the angle of attack that I focus on. That is the attack on the dualism of the inner and the outer. Two passages are particularly important in this attack, namely paragraph 304 and 293 because they contain as I shall try to show deep diagnostic insights about the dualism of the inner and the outer and the outer, and the outer. indeed what Three, a paradox and its dissolution. 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 At the heart of the idea of a private language is the idea of a private object. That is an object that only one person who has it can know of. Spelled out a little, this is the idea that everyone has a private domain consisting of items that no one else can possibly know of or understand any reference to. One's private domain is one's own in a radically, logically and non trans Preferable sense. We can begin to bring out Wittgenstein's diagnostic insight about the dualism of the inner and the outer by relating the idea of a private object to the idea of behaviorism. Oh, behaviorism. Indeed. Uh... 
these two ideas are mirror images of each other. Mm -hmm. oy, 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 oy. Behaviorism fixates on our behavior or outer life and denies the inner, treating it as a most is it at it as at most a convenient fiction. The idea of privacy takes the opposite extreme. 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 It tries to protect the inner by completely isolating it from our outer life, treating it as an intelligible, independently from that life. life. Both ideas do great violence to common sense and are attacked by Wittgenstein. The attack is particularly dramatic in paragraph 304. But you will surely admit that there is a different difference between pain behavior with pain and pain behavior without any pain. Admit it. What greater difference could there be? And yet you again and again reach the conclusion that the sensation itself is a Nothing. 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 <laughs> not at all. It is not a something, but not a nothing either. <laughs> the conclusion was only that a uh, Nothing would serve just as well as a something about which nothing could be said. We only reject the grammar which tries to force itself on us here, on us here. The paradox disappears only if we make a radical break with the idea that language always functions in one way, always serves the same purpose to convey thoughts. Which may be about houses, pains, good and evil, or anything else you please. Somebody please. By paradox, Wittgenstein evidently means his intensely paradoxical sounding statement. It, that is the sensation itself, is not a something, but not a nothing either. 
this statement looks like a contradiction, but it is not. This statement looks like a contradiction, but it is not. The key to avoid accusing Wittgenstein of contradiction is to realize that when he declares it is not a something, there is a slightly deferred qualification on the phrase a something, as namely, as something about which nothing could be said, but such an indescribable something is precisely a private object. And private object is going to be the last. 1932. Three thousand one hundred seventy-six. Yes, <laughs> it was rather large number. It was a bit short, but it was long enough for us to get into something really interesting. And since I just read it, I'm not going to recruit exactly those things, but I will start in that term. <laughs> A very important realization is to see that a something or a nothing about which nothing can be say, said mm. is actually something that is neither something or a nothing. So there is no contradiction in saying that. And that is a new and revolutionary to my ear revolutionary, although coming from PI, it is actually amounting to the very same thing. And uh, of course, I just got the zest of it. I fell asleep while reading this paper yesterday night. I'm very tired. But I still realize here is something very interesting. To say that the private object is a nothing, to deny it, it doesn't cut it. To say that it is something doesn't cut it either. It is actually neither or both, or it doesn't matter. I think it doesn't matter. The third alternative is the most correct because it's uh, whatever it is, something you can't say anything about. It doesn't serve a purpose. It does not enter into anything whatsoever. And this, oddly enough, has a connection to something you can read on the previous page. 3,175. <laughs> and that is the myth of the given. The very idea that you as a person has a sensuous almost, what could you say, that Kali here has a sort of non-logical, non-conceptual inner core. And we call that the census. And on top or around that, he has his conceptual thinking. And that there is a dualism in that between. McDowell and Follow, as he's following Wilfred Sellers, he does not agree. You cannot say it's disjunct. The rational is always involved in whatever is at the core, the senses. And this is a brand new dualism. That vastly more pertinent, I would say, that, than the old, which is also pertinent, of course, but we all share that, the idea that you have, have a core of something that is non-conceptual, 
pre-conceptual or proto-conceptual. Mm. How we usually think about those is like when I was a child, I didn't have any concepts and I still existed. Or when I die, all my concepts would be gone and only uh, the senses would remain. So I would lose all my concepts. I think this is a very good argument against permanent life. Many people say that, well, the soul can't contain anything conceptual, so why should, why should I bother? Here, we look into how we use language and what's really happening. And it seemed that we haven't think this through. This dualism is poisonous, is venomous. And the only way to treat it is like, imagine you have a wound somewhere and it's caustic, it's infected. And what you usually do is to put a bandage around it. Then you will let it rot even more. What you need to do, the only thing you need to do is open the bandage and let air come in and clean it. Nothing else. That's enough. Bring it to the open. Use your thinking capacities to bring it out. And you will see that this little thing is almost the same thing as the idea that a something or a nothing that doesn't have any qualities whatsoever is still something or nothing. We are, as to quote Heidegger, maybe unlawfully, I'm sorry about that, but we always already been in the world. And therefore, all objects, all concepts are part of us. They're not disjunct. I think, I think this dualism can be more hard to get at. And it needs to be treated as well, or approached at least, mm. to put into the open uh, to uh, being exposed to the air of thinking, to the open air, not hidden away. And what Wittgenstein does is brings it out. And I, this is also what uh, Mr. Howe here is doing in, in a very elegant way. Uh, Carla, please come and join. Thank you. Uh, the microphone, please. Um, yeah. You probably remember Sive de Moore's paper. Oh, yeah. That's in Rome. Yes. And I will uh, show you one interesting sentence here. Ah, uh, page 525, and this, uh, more doesn't explicitly comment on this, but I observe this myself. So this is a quotation from the book of Revelation, chapter 13, verses 3 to 4. Uh -huh. The entire earth was amazed by the beast, literally after the beast. That is it's actually looking at the behind of the beast. Ah. Of his oak, uh, after. And why do I bring this up? Yes, let's go back to Tang. 
down and here this sentence here I analyzed a particular diagnosis on the dualism according to which it, it is caused by an intellectualist conception of language. Mm. This diagnosis is strictly speaking wrong, wrong, but there are genuine insights behind it. Behind it, yes, behind it. <laughs> So behind I thought it in double sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because uh, obviously, uh, if you are wise, intellectual, we usually connect it with the brain. Mm -hmm. And he tries to undermine that this time. And and, and uh, it's not easy, uh, but I think that the behind can actually help us to get around this dualism. Mm -hmm. And yesterday I read Salvador Dali's auto, uh, second autobiography, oh. Le Journal de Autobiography, mm -hmm. and a Journal de Anna, a Genie, Le Journal de Anna, uh, Genie. It's called the year 60, and in the appendix, he has a very long appendix, which is a praise of the fart. <laughs> <laughs> Typically, Dali. <clears throat> uh, so, I think this is perhaps a way uh, that is the behind is neither inside nor outside. Mm, yeah. <clears throat> and this could help to us to, so to say, this relates also to the cut that uh, Tang takes up. Mm, he has yeah. not re uh, he has not yet really commented on the cut. No. So I'm interested to see uh, in the next lecture uh, how he develops the idea of cuts. But of course, behind is a cut. You won't be disappointed. Mm -hmm. I can tell you already. It's very interesting. Um, but I I think I will leave it there. Mm. Yeah, it is uh, one hard nut to crack this, and you need to think about it very deeply, but there is no difference whatsoever about a nothing or a something which you can say nothing about. Mm. And it's a little bit like what in quantum mechanics we say, the moon does not exist when you don't see it. Mm. If you have nothing whatsoever scientifically say to say mm. about the moon, mm. it doesn't really matter to say it exists or not. And these are one of those things that are so devastating for Western thinking is that we create things that has no pertinence whatsoever. And our whole mind, I think, and our whole soul gets caught up in these nonsensical objects. Mm. They have no qualities, no properties. It doesn't matter if they are or not are. And it's devastating. Mm. It's absolutely devastating. All of a sudden, you make no difference between things that are very important and things that are unimportant from the start and can never play any role whatsoever. And this is, this is going to be very nice parallel here, I think, I hope. This is exactly what Orgebor, the son of Niels Bohr, said to his doctors. Don't say that the atom exists. Mm. It doesn't add anything other than confusion. And this is not all you want. Mm. Uh, yes, I could actually say something. Is I wanted to talk and say because uh, help us to remember these lectures. If you see in front of you, you see this is lecture 1932. Mm, yeah, and I therefore I looked up 1932 uh, to refresh my memory. It was Nobel Prize Physics was about to open Heisenberg for the creation of quantum mechanics, the application of which was oh yeah, uh, oh hydrogen, mm, anthropic forms of hydrogen, indeed. And those forms of hydrogen came to kept coming up in the Second World War, and they. Uh, had a very great role in the construction or the triad or construction of an atomic bomb. Hmm. That's very interesting. Fantastic. Yeah, thanks for that. Hmm. What a good ending. Thank you very much, Kalle Lundahl. Thank you, everyone, for participating, for looking in. Hmm. Have a very pleasant noon, morning, afternoon, or night, wherever you are. Bye bye for now. <laughs>